It's my pleasure to introduce Neil Deswani. Neil is the co-director and the co-founder of the Stanford Advanced Cybersecurity Program. He is an accomplished technical visionary, angel investor, internet security thought leader, and he served in a variety of research, development, teaching, and executive roles at organizations from Twitter and Google to Yodley and Belcor. He was the chief information security officer at LifeLock and at Symantec's consumer business unit. He is also the co-author of the book, Security Foundations, What Every Programmer Needs to Know. And next Monday, he has a new book coming out called Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. My understanding, it's already hit a, an Amazon bestseller list in the uh, cybersecurity uh, in the cybersecurity category. So as I always say, Neil is really uh, uniquely positioned as both someone who's been a practitioner in the field for a long time and really understands it from that perspective, as well as an educator. He's really uh, in that unique position, able to give us a great overview of the cybersecurity landscape. And with that, I am going to hand the presentation over to Neil. Thank you, Pax, very much for that introduction. I'm thrilled to have all of you here today. Uh, glad to see hundreds of people in the audience for this webinar. I am going to be talking about key takeaways from recent cyber attacks. And what I'll do is go through a number of different cyber attacks from over the years up through the recent SolarWinds hack uh, this past December and tell you about what might be some cat you can take away. Uh, so to just tell you a little bit about some of the different breaches, uh, th there's a whole bunch of different large organizations that have been uh, hacked and breached over the years. I'm going to be commenting on a number of them, uh, Target, JP Morgan Chase, OPM, uh, up through Capital One and SolarWinds. I will spend more time, ideally, on the more recent ones over the past few years, namely the ones at uh, Facebook, Equifax, Marriott, Capital One, and SolarWinds. But I do think it's important to sample from some of these mega breaches. I also will be presenting data on not only some of the mega breaches, but on the 9,000 reported breaches that have taken place to date. But we're, we're not here to just uh, you know, talk about the bad news uh, and, and what we can learn from it. Uh, I'm going to be spending a little bit of time talking about the, the seven habits of highly effective security. So for those of you that are familiar with Stephen Covey's work on the seven habits of highly effective people, uh, my co-author for the Big Breaches book, um, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone, and I, we basically thought about what are the seven habits that are, are necessary to follow if you want your organization to achieve security. So I'll talk about, I'll sample from a few of the, those habits. We, of course, go into much more detail in the book. And then I'll talk about some technology defenses that you can use to address the root causes of breach. And I'll spend time talking about the root causes as well. So that will give you a little bit of a sense for what we're gonna cover over the next, say, 40, 45 minutes. And then I'm looking forward to taking some Q&A at the end. So please get your questions in. Our, our team at uh, the Stanford Center for Professional Development is combing through all the questions, uh, identifying great themes amongst the questions, and I'll do my best to address as many of those in, in one shot as I, as I can. So first, if we just look at some statistics from over the years, we can see that from the period of 2005 to about 2009, there were, on average, a few hundred reported breaches every year. And I should mention that California was the first state to pass a data breach notification law back in 2003, and that's when data started coming in. Even though there were also hacks and breaches before then, because of the law, it uh, gave more visibility into a number of these hacks and breaches. And so what we see from the years from 2005 to 2009 is it was mostly organized cyber criminals. As the internet and the web started getting used for more and more electronic commerce, cyber criminals realized that there's ways to make money by duping folks and stealing data. And so we saw many of those kinds of attacks. And even in 2005, there was a little bit of a concern uh, and a growing concern uh, amongst government organizations that 
foreign nation state adversaries were getting into the business of hacking and breaching uh, companies. And what happened in 2009 was that there was a uh, nation state, um, suspected nation state sponsored attack called Aurora that impacted uh, Google as well as three dozen other companies. Google was the first to kind of come out and talk about it. But what we saw after 2009 was there was a market increase in just the number of breaches that were getting reported per year. And so if we look at the stats from 2010 up until 2018, 2019, we see that there was almost a, a doubling in the number, uh, in the average number of breaches that were reported per year. And where we are now uh, here in 2021, we're coming off of the 2020, December 2020 discovered hack of solar winds in which nine government agencies in addition to about a hundred private companies have been have been hacked and uh well, let me also mention that while that hack is is referred to as the solar winds hack uh solar winds was just one of the companies hack there was approximately 30 percent of victim organizations that didn't even use solar wind so we'll chat more about that in, in detail in a few minutes here. But that's some of the stats just around the number of, of breaches that are getting reported. Let me also mention that the, the legal definition of breach is when somebody's name and sensitive identifiers about them are inadvertently exposed or stolen and a breach. There could be all kinds of system infiltrations where trade secrets and intellectual property and all kinds of other things get stolen, but uh, may not necessarily constitute a reportable breach. That said, many organizations, especially if they're public organizations and they uh, care about maintaining trust with their customers and consumers, they very often err on the side of, of, of reporting uh, security-related issues. Um, and we'll see that uh, in some cases, there, there are some breaches where, uh, for instance, Yahoo, when all three billion of their accounts got breached. The security team at Yahoo actually knew about that back in 2013 or 2014, but it didn't uh, get uh, disclosed until uh, 2016. And there's more fun to chat about there. Uh, while, while there has been um, increases in the number of breaches that have taken place on a per year basis, from the previous stats, we, we see that there was, was a stepwise increase. So if you hear any company say, oh, there's been an exponential you know, increase in the number of breaches, that's simply not true. But what, what is true is that the number of records that attackers are able to steal in each breach has been increasing. It has not only been increasing, but it's been increasing in a super linear fashion. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean exponential, that doesn't mean, I mean polynomial, but, but definitely increasing in a super linear way. So this graph here shows the number of records that have been getting stolen in a number of these breaches. You see that going uh, up and to the right. And the, the, the Yahoo breach, you know, especially prior to the SolarWinds hack, was clearly the largest breach that had taken place in the history of the internet in which all three billion of their accounts got, got exposed. Uh, and uh, even though the, the SolarWinds hack has been very significant, uh, the question is, how do you how do you measure the impact of that? Actually, just this past Friday, there were a number of uh, hearings uh, taking place um, at the uh, at, at the at the highest levels of, of leadership uh, with the with the Joint Committee um, for the Department of Homeland Security and uh, and and whatnot that you know analyzed all the all the breaches. So. How are all these breaches happening? Why are they happening? What are the causes of all these breaches? This graph here shows some of the causes as categorized by a database from privacyrights.org of the 9,000 breaches. And while it may look like hacking or malware is the largest cause of breach uh, with the highest bar here, the second bar uh, from the left, uh, there's some other causes that I think are also notable. So you see that there's a pretty high bar for physical loss, certainly over 1,500 breaches. And there's also a pretty high bar for unintended disclosure, which is uh, the third bar from the, from the right. And there's over 1,500 of those as well. 
why are why is physical loss of say devices or unintended disclosure or even portable devices when portable devices get lost or stolen why are those breaches well if you have data on media whether it be paper or data on such devices and the device gets lost or stolen if there is unencrypted data which has people's names plus sensitive identifiers about them that actually that that basically results in a reportable breach and if you if you add up things like physical losses plus portable devices plus unintended disclosures the number of breaches due to those reasons is actually larger than hacking or malware or organized cyber criminals or uh, you know or nation state attacks and so what this means is that for security of our organization one of the first things you should do is just make sure that uh, file vault is turned on on Macs, BitLocker is turned on on Windows, uh, that you employ not only uh, storage level encryption, but application layer encryption for all sensitive data on your servers, uh, so that when, when those kinds of issues occur, they, they don't just automatically result in reportable breaches. Encrypting data is a very, very good thing. And uh, Dan Bonet, uh, who's uh, one of my fellow co-directors, he's one of the the, the, the world's uh, luminary authority is in that area. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we have we have courses on on um, how to use cryptography correctly to encrypt things. I encourage you to check that out. So, so, so going on though, let me then now focus on hacking, hacking and malware. And so, I have I have um, this slide here, which shows unencrypted data as the most prevalent root cause of breaches. But there's a number of other very important root causes as well. So phishing, malware, third-party compromise or abuse, software security vulnerabilities, and inadvertent employee errors make up the root causes of breach. For those of you that are in the field and you're working to comply with a whole bunch of security standards, whether it be PCI to take credit cards, HIPAA to protect healthcare information, uh, SOX if you're a public company, FedRAMP, if you're doing work with the government, there's there's tons of these security compliance standards, and they all have many hundreds of checkboxes that you have to check. But what I want to highlight in this slide is that while there are many, many such checkboxes, the countermeasures that you have in place for these root causes, I would argue, are more important with regards to avoiding getting breached as opposed to just showing your good hygiene, good security hygiene through compliance. So uh, I think in some of the stories and histories of the breaches that I talk about, you'll see these root causes at work, and uh, I'll bring them to, to life as, as much as I can here. So, um, you know, these next two slides have a table that summarizes some of the biggest breaches that have taken place. And what I'll do is go into details on uh, some of them. So I'm not going to really spend much time here on the summary slides, but let me rather just get into some of the stories here. So one of the first mega breaches that, that took place was back in 2013 when Target, the retail chain of stores, got breached. They had 40-plus million credit card numbers stolen, and it was the first breach where the CEO and the chief information security officer were fired. I think prior to 2013, most companies thought about cybersecurity as an information technology issue. But in the aftermath of the target breach, it became clear that security and cybersecurity is not just a information technology affair. When things go wrong, it's not just the chief information security officer that gets fired. It's not just the chief information officer that gets get fired. The CEO can get fired too. In fact, in Target's case, not only was the CEO fired, but the board was sued, and there were tons of lawsuits that the, the company faced. Uh, the costs in the breaches were upwards of $250 million, and you might be interested in how did, how did it happen. Well, the way the Target breach happened is that they had a third party by the name of Fazio Mechanical Services that was responsible for the heating and air conditioning of all of the Target retail stores. And Fazio Mechanical Services had network credentials stolen, which the attackers used to then pivot into Target's network. So third party compromise was one of the root causes here 
once the attackers got in, they started sending out a whole bunch of phishing and malware attacks. And the attackers were able to pivot from the uh, systems uh, from the network at Fozzy Mechanical Services into the point of sale stations at all the retail stores because they had a relatively flat network. There was no segmentation between different parts of the network. And the more network segmentation that you have, the better, so that if one part of your network, say, gets compromised, that doesn't mean that attackers can as easily shift into other parts of the network. Now, Target had actually bought $1.6 million of FireEye sensors to detect malware, and those sensors were alarming. They were going off. Their alerts were getting processed by a team in India, and those alerts were getting escalated. But there was so many of them, there was so much noise that they couldn't get escalated and acted upon fast enough. Also, the categorizations for the malware were pretty, were pretty generic. And so uh, it, it's important to not only have the defenses, have the defenses well-tuned enough so that ideally every alert is actionable and that you don't have false positives that simply generate enough noise so that you can't delve into the real issue. So, so that was the synopsis of the target breach. And major, major takeaway from that, it made cybersecurity a board level issue. Cybersecurity is not just an IT issue. One, one final thing that I'll mention about the target breach is that it was the first of many third-party compromises that took place. So you're in security, we have the saying that you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if the weakest link is one of your suppliers, if they are tied into your network, if they have access to data, then they can very be easily be used to compromise your, your main organization too. Uh, the very next year, uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, one of the top banks in the country, uh, got breached. And by the way, l let me mention that in the Target case, what was stolen was credit card numbers. So not the not the worst thing in the world, because you can change credit card numbers, and it may incur some cost, but the, the effective credentials that were stolen can be invalidated, and you can give people new ones. Uh, there, there, there's other breaches that take place where things are, are worse, and the attackers get things that are not as easy to change. I'll talk about that in just a second. With regards to the JP Morgan Chase breach, what was stolen was 70 million plus customer names and email addresses. And by the way, for a bank, you'd imagine they, they, they manage a lot of money. They manage trillions of dollars of assets in some cases, at least hundreds of billions of dollars of assets. And it was uh, at least good that no money was stolen, uh, directly at least. Uh, but what, what happened is when their customer list of 70 million names and email addresses got stolen, it opened up those customers to potential spear phishing attacks. When phishing attacks used to take place on the internet, uh, cyber criminals used to send out tons of emails purporting to be from a bank and hoping that some of the recipients would be customers of the bank and would click on a link and go log into an imposter site, and then the attackers could use the stolen credentials to then try to steal money. But in this case, when you've got the entire list of, say, JP Morgan Chase's customers, you can send out much more targeted spear phishing emails because you know that they are customers of the bank. How did this breach occur? Well, it was a case where there was also a, a third party involved. And in particular, there was a company by the name of Simcoe Data Systems that ran a website that JP Morgan Chase used to run and administer their charitable marathon races on an annual basis. Uh, attackers had compromised a website certificate for Simcoe Data Systems and were able to get access to a whole bunch of passwords that JP Morgan Chase employees were using to log in to, to that charitable marathon race site. Unfortunately, many of them used the same password for that site as they did for their corporate banking systems. And so attackers were able to, to use that. Now, JP Morgan Chase uh, was spending over $250 million a year on their security and had two-factor authentication deployed almost anywhere. Two-factor authentication is, of course, that service which sends you a, say, a six-digit code to your cell phone uh, when you log in so that even if an attacker has stolen your password, if they haven't also compromised your cell phone, they shouldn't be able to get in. And JPMorgan Chase had two-factor authentication deployed 
almost everywhere, there was one server that did not have two-factor authentication deployed. And so the attackers that were able to, to take over that, that website and get access to passwords were able to log in as JP Morgan Chase employees uh, without having to do the two-factor authentication because it just simply wasn't enabled on one server. So uh, that's what happened in, in, in that breach. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, speed up. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the JP Morgan Chase. Uh, I'm sorry, I talked about JP Morgan Chase already. I'm going to talk about the Office of Personnel Management breach in 2015. Um, while the uh, breaches against Target and JP Morgan Chase uh, were mostly suspected to be cyber criminals, the Office of Personnel Management breach was one in which it was attributed to a Chinese-funded government uh, uh, attack in which the identity information for over 20 million government employees were stolen. Most government agencies use the Office of Personnel Management as their uh, human resources uh, database, if you will. And I think uh, most agencies, except for maybe the CIA, were, were, were using this. And the attackers uh, broke into the Office of Personnel Management. They were, they were not using two-factor authentication uh, very aggressively. They were under-investing in their security program. They, had, they were only spending $7 million a year, whereas even the Department of Agriculture was spending over $70 million a year. And so it was a case in which they, they failed to prioritize security aggressively enough, failed to invest in security, and failed to execute on cybersecurity initiatives like deploying two-factor authentication aggressively enough. There were a bunch of very sensitive systems that stored not only the identity information, but also fingerprints for a number of these government employees. And what happened in the breach is that attackers were able to exfiltrate uh, that data without being detected. There were actually two sets of attacker groups. And uh, when the OPM was notified by the, the, the U.S. Uh, computer emergency response team that they were, they were under attack, they identified a first set of attackers and took steps to kick kick them out, uh, but they were unaware that there was a second a potentially affiliated attacker group that were was in as well. So you know when you when you when you have a system where you have attackers in there, you need to kick them all out at the same time because the second that the attackers catch wind that you're onto them, they can then work to steal data. They can stop their operations around growing their footprint in an organization, and they can just steal data. So OPM attempted to, to kick out that first set of attackers in what they call the Big Bang, but because they were unaware that was a, there was a second set of attackers also in, they were unable to stop them in time. Uh, in, in the aftermath of all this, it was identified that uh, one in five of the devices um, at OPM were infected with malware. And, uh, you know, I talked about the, the, say, technical root causes of breach earlier, but three meta-level causes of breach are if an organization doesn't prioritize, invest in, and execute on cybersecurity initiatives uh, correctly and aggressively enough, then, then you can still get breached. So that's the Office of Personnel Management. It was probably one of the, the largest nation-state-oriented attacks. Um, the... The very next year, though, it became apparent that Yahoo had been uh, significantly compromised by uh, four Russian attackers, two ex-FSB agents, in which what the attackers did is they, they used malware and phishing attacks to get in to make their initial compromise. But one of the interesting things that they did is that they, and one question is, okay, even if they got in and stole a database of, say, 500 million usernames and passwords or a, or a billion usernames and passwords, uh, question is, how did they get access to all 3 billion Yahoo accounts? The way they did that is they reverse engineered Yahoo's cookie generation scheme. So as we know, when we go to a website, we enter a username and a password. Once you're authenticated, once your credentials are checked, then you're given a authentication cookie and your browser caches that. And really, it's that authentication cookie that goes back and forth between the browser and the server that authenticates you so that you don't have to type in your username and password on every page. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with the HTTP protocol that's used to run the web, it's a stateless protocol. And so 
you you the cookies are used to manage um, uh, consistent state in, in web sessions. So basically, once the attackers were able to reverse engineer the cookie generation algorithm for Yahoo, then they were able to log into any Yahoo account at will, just knowing the email address for the account. Uh, largest breach in the history of the internet at the time. And at the time that the breach was getting revealed to the market, Yahoo was in the process of getting acquired by Verizon. Uh, Verizon dropped their acquisition price from, I think, 4.8 billion to uh, 350 million, less than that, in the, in the aftermath of the breach. Um, so, you know, some of the root causes we've seen before, but what was unique is that they stole the cookie generation algorithm. So how your website generates cookies is of extreme critical importance. And I think it's important to, to reuse techniques and technology that have just been vetted and, uh, uh, you know, looked into over time. You know, if you're interested in the details of that, we have a course on uh, the foundations of information security, and we have another course on the, um, the on, on protecting and exploiting web applications, and there's more about, about that. Uh, let's see. It's not only uh, it's not only email accounts that got stolen. And by the way, when an email account gets stolen, those email accounts can very often be used to log into to banks or other things. So it's it's it can just be worse than email. Uh, it is important to protect email because it's kind of the center of communications for a lot of things. The very next year, uh, there was the largest uh, credit record related breach that took place at uh, at Equifax. Uh, for those of you that um, may have may have heard of this breach, you, you may have heard that there was a they were using an Apache Struts server that's used in in software development, and there was a vulnerability in the Apache Struts server that uh, was um, the, the world was kind of notified about by Apache, but uh, Equifax wasn't able to patch that in time. But that was just the the, the very beginning of it. Um, you know, in my book, I talk about how the initial compromise took place uh, just within within a few days of the of the vulnerability becoming known to the world. There were uh, a bunch of uh, requests from Chinese IP addresses that were probing the vulnerable Apache Strut server and seeing whether or not they could be exploited. Uh, the security team at Apache, uh, the security team at Equifax, attempted to notify many parts of the organization about the um, uh, about the need to patch, but uh, they had they had false negatives in their scans. There were a, a bunch of uh, you know more detailed issues, but once the attackers were able to to leverage that vulnerability, actually a full two months later, um, the, of, of the service still not being patched, they were able to. Uh, start uh, probing databases in Equifax's network because it was a relatively flat num network and there were something like 40 or 60 databases that were accessible from the compromised Strut server. There, there was also a number of other vulnerabilities that were used. Uh, the attackers dropped 30 different uh, web shells or backdoors into the environment at Equifax and, in fact, took advantage of SQL injection. They planted a uh, a, a Java server page into a web application that was accessible and use that to exfiltrate data out of at least one of the databases. So there were a number of things that, that went wrong, even though the Apache Struts vulnerability is what was talked about mostly uh, in the press. Let's see. Um, Facebook has had a number of hacks and breaches over the years, actually, in, in the corresponding chapter of my book. We talk about 10 distinct security incidents at Facebook. I don't have the time to go into all of them, but I think most of you may have heard of the Cambridge Analytica issue in which a third-party developer abused Facebook's APIs and stored data about uh, from tens of millions of profiles, and then that data was used to advertise and target voters in swing states to influence the 2016 election. Uh, that particular, um, you know, that that particular issue was was not a breach; it was a hack. Uh, there were there were other issues as well, where um, uh, you know Russian interests had abused additional features on the Facebook service 
to influence voters. Uh, and so there's been a lot of that that's been talked about. But what I'm going to do is delve into one one item at Facebook that was actually a breach uh, announced in 2018. On Facebook, there is a feature that allows you to view your profile, not as yourself when you're logged in, but allows you to see what your profile looks like when the general public looks at it. And that that particular feature is called view as. So on my Facebook uh, author page, it has this button here that says view as visitor. And when I click it, it um, hides a bunch of the menus and it hides information that I just kind of keep to myself. I want to keep to myself. But uh, this particular feature was abused in a pretty sophisticated in a pretty sophisticated attack, which took advantage of three distinct software vulnerabilities. And this attack occurred after Facebook locked down their APIs so that third-party developers could not abuse their service as, as easily. And let me just talk a little bit about how that happened. Facebook has a very nice blog post, and their security team put up a, a, a great um, kind of post-mortem and description of how this breach occurred. Let me talk briefly about the three vulnerabilities that came together. So on the, uh, you know, with the view as feature, there was a piece of functionality which allowed people to wish their friends happy birthday. And there was a feature that allowed one to post a video as part of that as part of that widget that allows you to wish your friends happy birthday. Um, it, uh, it, it incorrectly provided the opportunity to post a video. That was the first issue. The second issue was that a, a, a new version of that video uploader that was incorrectly provided access to, what it did is it gave more broad permissions to the uh, viewer than it should have. And then the third thing that went wrong is that when it generated an access token to, to allow someone to view the profile, it didn't generate an access token that would allow them to just view your profile, but rather it generated the wrong token. It generated a, a, an access token uh, for the user that was being looked up and that, as if, if I understand it correctly, also gave both not only read access, but also write access to the profile. And so there were tens of millions of Facebook profiles that were, were scraped due to this set of three vulnerabilities that came together. And, you know, in many breaches, it's, it's just one vulnerability that's used to get in. Uh, but this was this was pretty sophisticated, and I would I would suspect that this would have been conducted by a nation state who wanted to get at the profile information after Facebook had locked down a bunch of their APIs. So I thought that was particularly interesting. Uh, there, there's been additional uh, big breaches uh, in the case of uh, Marriott. Also in in 2018, they had a breach in which malware was used aggressively. Marriott had acquired Starwood, uh, which together with both hotel companies made Marriott the largest hotel company in the world. And in this particular case, what happened is that there was an undetected malware attack at Starwood that happened four years before Marriott's acquisition of Starwood even closed and was only discovered later on. And uh, so without, without getting into the technical details of malware, which is super interesting, uh, I, I'll, I'll just mention that when you, we, we talked a little bit about third party breaches, right? Third party compromises. The thing to keep in mind is that when you think about third parties, don't think only about suppliers, companies that you buy software from, for instance. You have to think a little bit more broadly than that. So when you're acquiring or thinking about acquiring a company, that company that you're thinking about acquiring is initially a third party. And they need to be not only vetted, like, say, a supplier, but need to be vetted in a more rigorous fashion than any potential supplier, because uh, after the acquisition closes, that third-party company becomes a first-party company. It becomes part of the first party. And so if that third party is breached and you acquire it, you are breached too. So what's really important, even, even in public companies, is while these things can be very sensitive when one company is acquiring another, it's really important to make sure that the security team has a, has a heads up and has the opportunity to vet that acquisition, not only by doing things like penetration testing and uh, 
reviewing their audits and stuff like this, but also doing proactive threat hunting. You want to make sure that they have not been breached and just don't know that they've been breached. And that's what, what happened here. In 2019, what occurred was the Capital One breach, which was probably one of the largest cloud security breaches to date. Capital One is known for aggressively using the cloud and using Amazon Web Services specifically. And when you use uh, Amazon Web Services, um, the, the, they, they, they do a lot to protect the infrastructure. But you are still responsible for the security of your applications running on that infrastructure. And what happened in the case of the Capital One breach in 2019 is there was a single lone attacker. So it was not a nation state. It was not a cyber criminal group. It was a single ex-Amazon employee who happened to have technical knowledge about how the cloud worked, but um, didn't even have any insider knowledge and was able to identify that Capital One's uh, servers, one of their EC2 instances, uh, one of their virtual machines running on, on the Amazon Web Services platform, had a vulnerability called the server-side request forgery vulnerability. And, and that vulnerability combined together with um, a set of permissions on some S3 data buckets that were used to store over 100 million credit applications uh, were, were, were stolen. And I, I've given past webinars on, on this particular one where I've delved in much more deeply. Uh, so you can check that out. We also, by the way, do have a cloud security course that will be uh, launching in the coming months. And uh, you know the details around this will be covered uh, much more in depth. What I wanna do is, uh, as, in terms of the last uh, hack that I'll cover, I wanna cover the SolarWinds hack, uh, which occurred just this past uh, December. This is interesting because it was a third-party compromise where SolarWinds was the third party, and they were leveraged to agencies, the U.S. Department of Treasury, the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice. There were over 3,500 email accounts that attackers were able to get a view into. Attackers were also able to steal um, some attack tools from FireEye, they were able to, and by the way, credit to FireEye for, for discovering uh, this, this particular attack and letting SolarWinds know and letting the, the community know. Uh, if they hadn't discovered it, the pieces might have eventually gotten pieced together, but FireEye is known for their very deep uh, forensics capabilities and uh, threat hunting capabilities. And so they, they, they put that to use to identify that um, SolarWinds software was getting used and so it, to, to, to hack into other companies. SolarWinds has over 300,000 customers and they have a product called Orion that was uh, used by a number of those customers and their, their um, product got taken advantage of. Attackers injected malicious code into the product in a very sophisticated sophisticated way, they, they infiltrated the build process such that while a compilation of their products were going on, there was a piece of malicious code that was injected. Uh, and then after the binary was built, the uh, malicious file was uh, removed and the original one was put back to make everything look normal. So it was pretty, it was pretty sophisticated in, in terms of that aspect. And um, there were 18,000 companies that could have potentially received the malicious code update. Out of those 18,000, it's been identified that 100 private sector companies uh, had the malicious code pushed to them and had compromises uh, in addition to the to the nine government agencies. So what was the impact of this? Well, I've, I've talked about some of the things that were, were stolen, um, but the, the full impact of it is, is, is yet to be determined. You know, when this, when this uh, SolarWinds hack occurred, there were some that were comparing the hack to a digital Pearl Harbor. And, and that, is a, that is a characterization that I, I disagree with for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first, um, Pearl Harbor was a complete surprise. The SolarWinds hack for, for those of us that have been in the field, uh, not a complete surprise because third-party compromises, we've seen many of them before, as I've talked about some of those already, Target, JPMorgan Chase, et cetera. 
Um, so, 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 so third party compromise, not a surprise. Uh, foreign nation state attacks, not a surprise as well. If we look at, uh, if we look at um, Russian, suspected Russian sponsored attacks, Yahoo's the largest, uh, you know, breach in terms of the number of accounts affected. And so not a surprise that there's a, a nation state behind this. Uh, and it's also uh, not a, not a, so not a surprise, but also when, when you look at digital, when you look at Pearl Harbor, all the carnage of Pearl Harbor was immediately visible the day of and the day after. Whereas in a, in a cyber attack like this, what the full implications are going to be may still not be understood for, for months or more. Uh, when, the, when the Office of Personnel Management breach occurred back uh, in the 2015, 2014, 2015 timeframe, the kind of quotes that came out in the congressional hearings surrounding that basically said that the counterintelligence impact of that breach would affect efforts for at least a generation um, and may, may never fully be known. And I, I would take a guess that there might be similar issues at, at work here. In any case, uh, the, the SolarWinds uh, hack is interesting. By the way, let me also uh, just reiterate that while this hack has been called the SolarWinds attack, 30% of the victim organizations don't use SolarWinds at all. And the fact that it's called the SolarWinds hack may just be a nature of the order in which the discoveries have taken place. So because FireEye I did, did use SolarWinds and identified that there was a, an issue uh, that came through the SolarWinds Ryan product, uh, after that, there was a whole bunch of victims which have been identified to be part of the same overall attack, but don't use SolarWinds at all. And I think what SolarWinds has done is it has sensitized us. It's, it's probably the first third-party compromise in which there have been so many end targets that have been have been uh, taken advantage of. And by the way, the, the, the third reason that I, I disagree with the digital Pearl Harbor characterization is because it appears that the goal of the attacker here was most likely espionage to get information and steal information, but not, uh, say, commit an act of war in which you're working to, to harm people or whatnot. Um, so, so I think that th there was a lot of dust in the air post the announcement of this hack. Uh, and some of, the, some, of, some of the picture is getting clearer, especially uh, after the, the, the hearings this past Friday. But I think there's still going to be a lot more to learn. And I think that the key issue that it's sensitizing us all about is that the security of our software supply chain is very important. If an attacker is able to infiltrate any party along the third party supply chain, they can target the end organizations and they can do it in very, very stealthy ways. Uh, the the SolarWinds attack was um, what was first uh, first started taking place in in late 2019 uh malicious code started getting sent out i believe in march 2020 and happened for a few months and, and the attack didn't get discovered uh until december 2020 by one of you know the top forensics players in the field fireeye so this was this was uh very interesting in, in, from many perspectives so in any case, uh, that's uh, that's solo wins. I think I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know now chat a little bit about uh, how can we look at um, what are the kind of right habits that we need to have in an organization in, in order to uh, become less susceptible to breach. So you know in in, in the book, um, my co-author Moody El Bayadi and I we uh, outline seven habits for highly effective security in organizations and. You know, for those of you that are familiar with Stephen Covey's work on highly effective people, you'll notice that habits one and seven are similar to his habits. So, you know, his first habit is to be proactive. We amended that to say you need to be proactive, prepared, and paranoid. And uh, his seventh habit is called sharpen the saw. I mean, you always want to get better, right? Uh, we we term that embrace continuous improvement. And so there are some similarities there, but the 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 core habits in the middle are very specific to 
security, what I'll do is just talk about a couple of them. So let me talk about habit two, being mission centric. So security practitioners are often very, very focused on mitigating risk. And one of the challenges in the field is to get security and technology people speaking the same language as the CEO and the board. And the more that any cybersecurity initiatives can do to help grow a business, the better. So for instance, if you're pursuing getting HIPAA compliance, the higher order bit there, the more important thing, the, the why you're doing that is so that you can enable a company to grow and go into the healthcare market and deal safely with protected health information. And, and that should be, say, the primary uh, reason. Um, uh, and so, you know, you don't want to be perceived as, oh, you're just, you know, checking some boxes here, but you, you want to help grow the business. And the reason that it's important to speak that language is so that you can, uh, you know, also get more funding, not only to achieve the compliance, but to help with the underlying countermeasures that you need to play in, put in place. So it's always good if you, if you can look at the root causes of breach and look at what countermeasures you need to put in place and then achieve the, the, the compliance as a side effect of doing the good security work. So I think that sometimes technology and security professionals um, you know, pursue their initiatives and don't connect the dots to what the larger business is doing. And so on this particular slide, we show some examples of talking about security security projects where the dots are not being connected with the larger business overall, and then some examples where they've been rephrased to keep in mind the larger business context. Uh, another habit that I'll talk about uh, that's super important is to always work to build security and privacy in. It's very hard to bolt security on afterwards. It's kind of like quality. When you build a, a product, you can't say, well, I'm going to build a product, I'm going to launch it, and then I'm going to make it a high-quality product. It's kind of hard to do that because quality is an inherent characteristic of the thing itself that you're building. And the way to think about security is that it's just a kind of quality. So if you don't focus on building it in, it's really hard to bolt it on afterwards. Um, as we've seen, by the way, with just the, the, the architecture of the, the Internet itself, and, you know, in, in one of our... Um, courses and one of our webinars or, or whatnot here, we, 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 we spend time interviewing Vint Cerf, who was one of the inventors of TCP IP, the protocols that the entire internet runs on. And we would talk to him about the history of the internet and the history of security on the internet and how things developed and evolved the way they did and, and why and how, um, how the internet has uh, absorbed more and more security technology and countermeasures over time. But we also see some of the some of the challenge uh, with that. So so the more that you can build it in at the beginning, uh, the better. The final thing that I'll mention in terms of habits is that, as with many things in management, it's important to measure security just like you measure a whole bunch of other things. Because if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So focus on measuring security. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. There's a whole bunch of different compliance standards. There's a whole bunch of uh, different assessments that you can get. I have a bunch of them listed on these slides. Some of them can give you qualitative measurements, like pass-fail. I passed my PCI compliance. Uh, and, and they're white box because they look at uh, internal documents. But then there's other things like a security scorecard and BitSight, where they're quantitative. They give you a 0 to 100 score. They're black box. They, they just look at your organization from the outside, but they, they give you an understanding. And then there's things that are in the middle where they're quantitative, but they look at things inside. So, for instance, BSIN, the building security in maturity model, um, assesses how many different software security practices is your organization using. And that can give you an indication as to the level of maturity of your of your software organization. So those are some habits to keep in mind. And I think that in addition to using macro measurements, it's important to use micro measurements as well, especially for the root causes of uh, breach. Any countermeasure that you have for a root cause of breach, I believe it's important to understand what is the scientific effectiveness of that countermeasure. You could always deploy you know, open source ClamAV anti-malware that's based on looking for signatures of past known malware, but the likelihood that's gonna, that that is going to be effective against any 
organized cyber criminal or nation state is is almost next nil. Uh, so so you've got to measure things like what is the mean time to detect a compromised host? What what are what percentage of malware threats are identified upon first observation of any new malware sample? Uh, attackers these days will target an organization, they will understand what antivirus are they using, and they will generate a whole bunch of malware variants. They will run it those variants through all the antivirus tools that are being used until they come up with variants that are completely undetected. And then those are the variants that they'll launch against the organization. So, you know, looking at a study of you know, what percentage of known malware is detected is may not be as helpful as looking at, uh, I mean, that might be just big table stakes. You got to look at what percentage of unknown malware is detected. And then, as we talked about in the target case, you know, what's the, what's the false positive rate? Because if there's a lot of false positives, it's going to dilute your uh, actionability on, uh, on, on actual threats. And so it's important to have a high fidelity uh, detection rate, and and for each of these root causes of breach, you can you can come up with um, scientific metrics and measures that you can use to evaluate the effectiveness of the countermeasures. So in any case, um, those are those are some things to keep in mind. Um, how do you how do you prevent breaches? What kind of countermeasures should you use? On this particular slide, I list just a few examples for each of the root causes of breach. What are some of the countermeasures that you can deploy? And you know, in my book, I talk about the, the trade-offs between them. Uh, so some of these defenses are gold, some of these are silver, some of them are bronze, uh, and there's a lot more that I could say, say, say on that. But I hope I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to talk about uh, key takeaways from a bunch of the big breaches that have taken place. You know, cybersecurity is a wonderful field to get involved in and get into. You don't have to be a master hacker. Uh, th there's many different roles that we need. There's about a million people working in the field in the United States, and probably uh, there's hundreds of thousands of open job openings. So please, uh, please uh, consider uh, getting involved. You, you, you can apply a lot of the skills that you have. Um, in fact, in my book, I have a, the last chapter is about about how you can take your existing skills and, and use it to get into the field of cybersecurity. So, uh, with that, I hope that uh, companies uh, and other organizations invest primarily to address the root causes of breach, um, not get taken away by you know the new cool security vendor marketing. Don't focus on just achieving the minimum compliance bar. Achieve the compliance as a side effect. And I hope that uh, the information here has been helpful in helping you think about how to prioritize defenses organization. Thanks so much, Neil. That was uh, fantastic. We have uh, quite a few great uh, sort of questions that came in throughout the session, Neil. I think if there's not one that you want to start on, I thought one interesting place to begin is you mentioned a lot of the effects of these, uh, you know, the potential effects of a lot of these breaches or hacks. Um, but you've also mentioned that the, the full extent of those impacts, we don't know, and we may never know. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Do, have there been any studies in terms of increases in identity theft or fraud in the wake of some of these major breaches? And if not, do you have, you know, where, where can we learn more about what the actual impacts are on us, the consumer or the user or the individuals who, whose information has been breached? Thank you for that question. It's a very good one. While I've commented that there's been 9,000 plus reported breaches to date, there are companies that, for instance, they monitor the dark web for unreported breaches. So when people's um, usernames and passwords get stolen um, from organizations, sometimes they, they pop up on the dark web. And so the number of unreported breaches is, 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 is beyond that um, 9,000 mark. Uh, and by the way, with some foreign nation state attacks, right, their goal is to, you know, get data on, say, where, 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 when spies were staying where in, in various Marriott hotels, right? Uh, th that kind of data may never hit the dark web because a, a, a good foreign intelligence agency will want to keep that uh, uh, close to their vest. So, you know, I, I would, I would recommend that, uh, you know, getting things like uh, identity theft protection is is important. Um, you know, much more broad in scope than things like credit monitoring. 
for, for a bunch of these things, we just we just may never know. For, for all of us, there is much more data about all of us outside our homes and in tons of different uh, enterprise and government databases than there is inside of our home. So, um, I, so, so apologies if this is a little unsatisfying. Um, we, we can only know what we know um, once uh, certain things get detected. Um, but I think one should always assume that uh, you know there, there's more out there that we don't know has been has been detected. So um, uh, you know we, when you when you plan your own defenses for your organization or personally, uh, I would uh, make sure that you're always using you know two factor authentication for everything, uh, every online account that offers it, uh, leverage IAFF protection, um, sign up for dark web monitoring. Uh, and, and uh, you know the hope. The hope is that with with uh, you know the, these companies that monitor just trillions of data points and trillions of data sources, whenever there's anything about you that may that may become known, then you'll get to find out about it. So uh, so, so so it is it is a bit unsatisfying. Um, we, we we learn more over time. Uh, I think that um, you know when I think back to my own PhD defense. Uh, I was I was asked about uh, you know prevention versus detection versus containment versus recovery, and uh, I'm I'm of the opinion that one should try to focus as much on prevention as possible. Um, but given the world that we're living in, uh, we have to we have to realize that there may be a lot of data that's stolen, and so detecting when that data is getting abused is just as important as prevention. Thanks, Neil. And I, I want to be respectful of your time and everyone who's joining us today. I think one other question that came up a lot, especially in, in connection to SolarWinds hack, is this whole issue of 30 third party platforms and uh, and the you know as they're being compromised. So I think they're kind of um, there are maybe two two related questions. So first, I know and when we've had a, I think it was when we had a conversation is there's is when you're patching third party software, do you always want to just automatically patch all your software, or do you are, are there times where you need to be more thoughtful when it's, it's patching particularly critical infrastructure that you have. And secondly, um, well, let's start with that one. And, you know, in general, in terms of patching and updating third-party software, what can we do to prevent it? And is there something in maybe being more thoughtful as, as you implement patches? So overall, I think it is very important to leverage uh, patches and get patches deployed um, as fast as possible. Um, I think if we look at the number of vulnerabilities uh, that are identified and that are getting exploited by attackers, you know, if you don't patch, you are leaving yourselves open to being taken advantage of by, by any and all of those vulnerabilities. Now, the other side of this is that in the case of SolarWinds, there was a uh, certificate um, that was used to sign a lot of the software updates, and because the attackers were able to infiltrate the building of the software. Malware was able to get deployed through a trusted uh, deployment source. And so in that case, getting the patch could have potentially resulted in you uh, getting uh, compromised or infiltrated. Um, and, and while that was the case there, I think overall, the, 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 there, is, there is much more benefit in patching than in not patching. And I think that what's going to happen in response and reaction to the SolarWinds hack is that there's going to be more innovation and investment into software integrity and the build pipelines. So uh, uh, Sudhakar Ramakrishna, who's the new CEO at SolarWinds at the hearing this past Friday, he mentioned that SolarWinds is going to publish some information about how they're going to be defending their software build pipelines so that attackers cannot inject malicious code into their patches, which is great. I hope to see that, and I hope to see a lot of similar things in the, in the field uh, such that we can pretty much err on the side of patching uh, as often as, as we can, ideally automatically, and have integrity and trust in the software patches that are getting rolled out. Thanks, Neil. Uh, we're just a little bit over time, and there's still a lot of questions, but I think uh, we'll end there, and that's a nice, hopeful note, and we're looking forward to seeing what the future developments are in response to the solar winds. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everyone who joined us today for their time. We really appreciate you joining us and your active participation. 
As I mentioned at the beginning, a recording of this session will be sent out in about a week. So if you happen to miss something or if you want to review something, you'll have that available soon. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, everyone, again. Thanks, Pax, for having me. Thanks uh, to the team at uh, SCPD uh, behind the scenes for uh, making this a, a great, smooth session. And thanks to all of you who were able to attend. I hope that uh, you came in learning something, at least one or two things that you didn't know before, and uh, look forward to potentially getting your help in fighting cybersecurity battles in the future.